I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. I'm joined today with John Harland, who you may know from previous uh, uh, videos, but especially um, our, uh, his tutoring me about uh, linear regression. And now for the second time, I have another old friend, uh, Shu Hong Ju. Uh, we all studied together at University of California at San Diego. He studied experimental psychology. So a completely different perspective on linear regression. Hi, Shu. Hi, Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> so my background, so, my background is uh, I took with my iPhone. Oh, and where is that? It is the Redwood Park in uh, in uh, like uh, North Northern California. Mm -hmm. Oh, which uh, Northern California? Redwood yeah, Park. It's, yeah, Redwood Park. Yeah, it's uh, the Eureka. You know, near near the. It's a uh, which county? I oh, far, bought. far north. Humboldt. I'll, I'll add, um, to say, for our viewers, <laughs> but to say that uh, I've been hiking with Shu Hong, I've been hiking with John, um, but uh, I've been hiking with, uh, once with, uh, or twice maybe, or three times with Shu Hong's advisor, uh, was uh, experimental psychologist Norman Anderson. I think you know Shu Hong. We got a letter that he passed away uh, last yes. fall after a very long age. There's a whole school of students uh, who, um, uh, a whole school called information integration theory, which is different than a newer information integration <laughs> theory, but it's the original information integration theory. Um, and so Xu Hong was uh, his uh, uh, graduate student uh, and they met in China and he got invited. Uh, he was so impressed that he invited him to come to the United States. And so we became uh, roommates. Uh, uh, and so that was very exciting. Uh, that was back in 1986 and 1987. Yes. Yes. So many years. Many years. <laughs> so why don't we start? So maybe a bit about your background as a psychologist, and then what would linear regression mean to you? Well, actually, uh, when uh, when, I, when I was in graduate school, I don't think I ever really uh, uh, use linear regression in the in the, in the, <laughs> in the sense that when you do a, a randomized study it's very easy you just compare two rates you know oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> but you know of a general general linear model that we use you know that's kind of behind uh, a lot of a statistical calculation um it's actually more and and uh, it was more uh, you know, we're more focusing on like trying to come up with clever experimental design than than uh, working mm -hmm. on the the regression itself. In my work, in the, now I mostly work in the field of public health. I kind of uh, haven't been doing experimental psychology proper for for a long time. Uh, in public health, we do a lot of linear <laughs> regression, <laughs> and um, I'm actually kind of a little bit of a known among my own graduate student postdocs like i i have a relative pessimistic view of how people use linear regression because mm -hmm. i think it's with the uh, ease of a personal computer you have a, a statistical software you could hit a button and it would generate a statistic for you right mm -hmm. so people do a do a, a lot of uh computations without really knowing like exactly what it means in fact that the paper that i sent to sent to you know by uh freeman from berkeley that uh, he kind of uh, basically summarizes kind of the abundant use or abuse of linear aggression you know mm -hmm. that uh, that in my own like kind of teaching especially working with graduate student postdocs uh, trying very hard to ask them to like what exec exactly kind of conceptual model you have in mind um mm. before you just hit the button <laughs> in a computer keyboard um that probably uh um i'm kind of a little bit colored by uh, reading so so many papers that people just run regressions and hoping 
a p value come out to be lower than 0.05 <laughs> oh. <laughs> so they have something to publish <laughs> it's um, like a jackpot <laughs> yeah it is it is um but uh you know we do use them as a as a uh, especially in um in uh in a setting where you can't do experiment, right? So sometimes you kind of mm -hmm. try to check with, just to see if a, a variable is correlated with uh, another variable. And I often more use it for like an exploratory analysis rather than as a kind of final uh, uh, proof or anything. Mm. That's, and that's very interesting. And that brings to mind uh your advisor's book, uh, Norman Anderson, uh, on empirical design, right? Like, so right, right, right. he wrote a textbook on uh, using statistics and maybe, and it was completely from the point of view of how do you set up an experiment? Like you were saying, what's the smart way to set up an experiment? <laughs> and he had a whole uh, experimental pyramid, you know, like how do you build up this argument? And so statistics would be towards the end, but that basically you have to have a very, you know, good idea and good conception. So, um, yeah, right. He put the, all the uh, math at the end of the book, <laughs> like right. chapter zero after chapter 21 or something like that. <laughs> He's like, here, you actually calculate. No, that was kind and of so, interesting. And, he and was so I went to back to, I, it, it's very, it's very inexpensive, uh, the Kindle version. Uh, it's, mm. it, 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 it costs very little. Um, I have it. and. Um, he has uh, sections on like multiple linear regression, et cetera. Right. And with these critiques, like, right. you know, where you're saying like to be, you know, very careful, but, but, oh, so what I wanted to say was that, so it's interesting how you use it, like for playing around with the data or kind of like invest, you know, kind of exploring. And, mm -hmm. and so it's like, it seems like one step in the process, like, so it shouldn't be the whole, uh, you know, um, argument basically, but it can be one right. part of that argument or discovery. Yeah, because concept. a lot of time we don't even know the 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 condition the for for running the regression is uh, are met. You know, like for example, a lot of relationship are simply not linear in in the behavior we're dealing with, mm -hmm. right? So, but oh, you mm -hmm. kind of force it. Because we don't know what to do with nonlinear relationship most of the time. It's so difficult. So you just assume it's linear and you run regression, right? And uh, and sometimes I, uh, I'll get students just to practice, like, uh, well, you're adding another variable, you know, because a lot of time uh, uh, you're adding a variable, you, you change the correlation of matrix, right? And uh, the problem in our, in, public health and in many ways the social science in general i think it's true a lot of time in economics the field of economics um, i don't know enough about economics but i read enough paper from it sometimes they suffer the same problem like running massive <laughs> regression model and a lot of time it's it's the variable you don't measure that might be more important so you're running a regression model without any information of a key variable <laughs> Right. He, he, so he gives uh, your advisor, he gives like seven or eight examples, you know, multiple linear regression. Like, so the, the one that I remember was uh, uh, bombing, you know, bombing runs uh, in uh, World War II. Uh, and so um, they had all this data, the Allied forces, on uh, how fast they were flying and how low they were flying mm -hmm. and uh, how much enemy opposition they were getting. You see, and so they have those three factors, and they're doing regression, you know, to try to figure out. Uh, and what they, you know, the idea is that like the slower you go, the better the accuracy. But you may be, you know, or and the lower you go, the better the accuracy. But then you may be more vulnerable to um, air, opposing fighters. So it turned the thing that the correlation that was bizarre was that uh, the higher uh, the amount of opposing aircraft the greater the success of the bombing mission <laughs> you know and so can you understand that john or not <laughs> like what's the what's the explanation for that the the more you know fighting opposition you get the greater your bombing accuracy it's not that hard when you you know you think about it but what's the reason oh um. it's a logic puzzle <laughs> but it shows yeah. a correlation <laughs> 
I guess they force you to fly low if you're. Uh, Do you know the answer, Xiong? No, I don't even remember this example. You. It's a, so it's the missing variable. The missing variable was cloud cover. You oh. see, oh. if there's no clouds, accuracy is great. <laughs> but opposition is also great. So I see. No, Maybe but it's, it's not so easy to guess. But no, but, but it's the but it, that is the big issue in a lot of uh, uh, regression models that I've read. Like, well, you, you just do uh, you just do a calculation on the things you you happen to measure, right? And mm -hmm. then without a conceptual model, a lot of times you don't get the, the most important thing, you know. In um, but that's a it's a it's a unfortunately sometimes it's the it's kind of the the disease in the academic world because uh, because the convention where you publish results with them mm -hmm. so what's significant the, what would, significant correlation right so what would be uh examples of use and abuse like um uh, that you would like good use versus uh bad use well um I'm unfortunately I have more more examples of uh bad use, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, but the the I think uh, coming back to the 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 issue of like ease of a uh, computer programming, like you know, mm -hmm. that you, you just because it was very difficult to have bad use or multiple regression uh, when you have to actually calculate yourself. <laughs> because it's, it's extremely difficult. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you have two variables. You just, uh, but the, uh, but the the bad example would be the, you know, actually having too many variables. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, when you have so many variables, there's not even enough subjects in the in the data you collected, right? Mm. And uh, because it's a multi-dimensional. You often run into empty cells. In a lot of time, I would try just to ask the, like you have to, you have a, just say each variable. If you like do a simple like a, a regression model where things just measure in a binary uh, mm -hmm. um, values, and uh, you could say you could have five uh, Five variables, just say two by two by two by two. By two. <laughs> There's already a lot of cells, right? Right. And then when you keep adding things, a lot of time they measure more than two two values. And uh, a lot of time, very soon you have uh, you have a huge amount of uh, cells to deal with, and often there's empty. Right. But a computer wouldn't tell you. A computer will impute value for you. Um. Just impute for, for you because uh, because you can force the computer to do what you want it to do, right? And it would. Generate. I see. So the cells are non-real, but the computer will still give it. Right, do it for you, yeah. It will give you an answer. Yeah, it will give you answer, and that's because you 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 are doing so much calculation uh, just by itself. Um, but I think the I I do think the uh, it's useful for for. Uh, for uh, exploratory analysis, sometimes mm -hmm. it's confirmation. Like if you already have, uh, mm -hmm. if if you have enough uh, reason, like this convergence are evident, right? Um, that that's the key. Like uh, you you have to get the data lined up in such a way there's a reason to believe like something's reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but because of a certain, like I'm talking about, like non-experimental result, actually, of like when you do experiment, and uh, especially I'm thinking about like uh, uh, when uh, when the the subjects are randomly assigned into mm -hmm. different conditions. So by doing that, you the, the randomization is the best way to control the unmeasured thing. Basically, you don't know what's going on. But by random my enough subjects into the experiment, right? That's the key. You got you have to you have to get enough people to randomize. So you, so the distribution of important variables, uh, even though you might not measure them, will will equal out 
and then you you hardly need any uh, really regression model, right? It's the uh, it's the best way to control something that you don't know. Like you, mm -hmm. not only you know, you mm -hmm. you don't know how to measure them. You might not even be aware of it, right? Um, so what? What? But, sorry. Go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Oh, so what I'm, I guess what I'm grasping, so to speak, is that um, there's um, levels of control. Let's say so. The highest level of control was the type of thing I think your advisor and and you were doing. Um, was where you do, I don't know if it's called a factor analysis, yeah, like you'd have yeah. like a three by Fact, three grid, yeah, let's say, of possibility, design, yeah. right? Yeah, factorial. And it was a uh, factorial design. So um, what would be an example of factorial design? Oh, factorial design would be, well, like say for, here's an example of uh, if, uh, if um, like the that I'm doing now, like for example, mm -hmm. um, you, you want to know if uh, a behavioral intervention Mm -hmm. And and uh, pharmaco pharma pharmacological intervention, like if they each contribute to to uh, uh, some particular thing you study that is going to change certain people's behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Certain behavior. Well, you could you could you could uh, using a behavioral element and a ph pharmacological element. So you'll be two by two. You either you're getting. So, so behavioral could be like counseling or literature. Literature. Or, or in this case, I could just incentivize. You give your money to do things. Money, okay. <laughs> right? That may be easy. Okay. <laughs> and then pharmacological would be like a, some kind of drug. Yeah, um, I'll send you some drug. Like if I want to help people quit smoking, right? So okay. either, either quit uh, for money or quit for uh, getting a free, free medication. Right? Okay, so you offer to pay if they stay quit. That'd be one. Yeah, or, or just for trying. You don't, they don't even have to stay quit. In fact, okay. I tend to be more interesting, like just for trying than stay quit. Okay. Because then they don't have to, they don't have to misreport their right. success, right? Right. Like, That's good. Right. Try, trying is easy because <laughs> you can always do something. But uh, but the factorial design of that will allow it's very efficient because uh, it's uh, actually doesn't require additional subjects, but allow the independent contribution and the interaction of both factors to be computed at the same time. So you have a, mm -hmm. if you write it out that you have a, you know, um, you have a, a, a factor A and factor B and factor A times B, right? And you can, you can figure that. Oh, or you have both, let's say. You have example. both, right. In one and you may have also neither, right? Like you may yeah, have a yeah, control exactly, group. Neither. Exactly. So it'd be A and B and A and B and neither. So they allow you to to isolate the individual factors contribution and also to calculate whether there might be a significant interaction. And you may then compare the results, like were they successful in quitting? Did they fail? And maybe how many days, let's say? Yes. Those would be the, and so you'd have- That would be the independent measure, right? However, that's the thing you want to calculate, mm -hmm. right? And so just because, uh, just for our viewers who are- <laughs> To say there was a video uh, on uh, building an equilateral triangle, uh -huh. and it uh, had exactly this type of factor breakup, like where you have two conditions. You know, you draw to build it. If you have an edge and you draw uh -huh. an equilateral triangle, uh -huh. uh, you have two conditions. Uh, you need one edge to go. Basically, you build a circle that would be like one condition, and then another circle would be another condition. You look where they cross. Uh -huh. So there's a so there's you have like this uh, power set lattice like no conditions condition A condition B and then both conditions and that's exactly what you described I think yeah yeah exactly very interesting yeah and when you when you set up experiment like that um you know I mean it's it's a regression model when you 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 can run mm -hmm. them right and uh, so you isolate the coefficient for A and for B and for A and B right and uh, a lot of time when you do experiment like this, you will find out like it's very interesting. There is no um, often there is no additive effect. Like oh. there's only so much people would change. <laughs> uh, piling things up uh, is not gonna give a lot, right? right. And uh, I actually give an optimal example. Like when you try one like behavioral thing and one let's say counseling, right, and one pharmaceutical. And uh, you're more likely to get added effect than if you try two 
uh, behavioral thing, a two pharmaceutical thing. So that has been tried many times. And actually, pharmaceutical uh, people try a lot harder in this aspect. You know, they try to add one drug on top of another. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like in the in my field, like helping people quit smoking. Well, we'll give you nicotine gum, then give you patches, <laughs> we'll give you inhaler, you know. Uh, you would think, you know, one is administered through your, you know, your oral administration, the other one's the transdermal, but they usually don't go, don't go very far. <laughs> and, and, and that brings up the case, like, um, what are the types of um, concepts, you know, or categories or whatever, like, you know, how are they, like, you know, are these things the same category? So they're not really, you know, distinguished or are they conflicting categories, you know, like, you know, that two could be worse than one because, you know, it's just more complicated or more troublesome, whatever, et cetera. So this issue of like, you know, comparing apples and oranges conceptually, you know, how is it, how are, what are, what's the status of these um, variables? Uh, so when you, uh, you have these possible layers of um, control, like one is the total control, which we've been, you've been talking about, like the factorial um design factor analysis. But then the other would be, well, if you can't do that, I and mean, often you can't, but you'd have like a randomized where, you know, you have different people. And so you may have different populations. And I mean, when you have more control, then you're able to uh, say, I think like Judea Pearl says, like, you know, you can do something or not do it. Right. So that's more uh, in, in informative from a causal point of view. But if you can't do that, uh, then you still, uh, with a randomized, you know, with a randomized group, you're hoping that you're eliminating any kind of um, um, back uh, variables, you know, in any the hidden, any hidden variable, right? Hidden that, variables, uh, right? That uh, that uh, would get equal out by randomization. But but let me and, give and you an example. And then, and, and, and then in the lower level, it would just be some kind of like not even randomized, it's just some kind of latent variables. You know, and it, then it's just very, it's the problems that you were talking about. That's uh, very tricky. So let me give you a prime example in like epidemiology, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it's very well known to, like, if you eat uh, uh, food with uh, rich, like a beta carotene, mm -hmm. um, yeah, then you're less likely to uh, end up like having lung cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And the, uh, it's a that's a linear regression model because the mm -hmm. correlation very consistent. Like plenty of studies show one after another, uh, showing that uh, uh, that seems to be very good for you if you uh, if you do that. Well, so they eventually try to do a randomized experiment. Like they don't know what's really going on, right? For sure, but its correlation is very consistent and strong. And so, well, you can't really stuff people with too much too much food. So you take supplement, right? <laughs> you get concentrated beta carotene. And, um, and uh, so they did a randomized control trial and there are several of them all very large and they all had to, to stop halfway through because it turns out if you take beta carotene, you'll be more likely to get lung cancer. So obviously, <laughs> That wasn't the data character. I shouldn't be laughing. I guess people. Suffering. I know it's a, <laughs> it's horrible. a it's a horrible thing, and uh, they all had to stop uh, halfway through because it became unethical to continue the experiment, right? Mm. And it was something about these people who would. Uh, 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 like eat food uh, rich in this particular uh, uh, compound, and uh, and uh, I should use compound, you know, but the uh, the uh, uh, the correlate was you no know, the health outcome that they don't get lung cancer, right? Less likely, mm -hmm. I should say. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a huge struggle trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. So they still don't know because they can't do the experiment. Is I haven't gone back to the literature. It's not my field, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a prime example because it was for so many years, uh, mm -hmm. so many experiments, lots of money poured in it, right? And um, but it was all based on the regression model. Um, I'm the most recent. There's just one uh, another 
study just published only a few months ago uh, uh, by a group of scientists in uh, in um, Denmark, I believe, on colonoscopy, mm-hmm. right? And um, and that's a it's a it's an interesting. Well, let me just slow down a little bit here. <clears throat> part of the reason, part of the reason that uh, uh, that we have trouble with is like we don't really have a, a good um, kind of model for the connect for the correlation, right? Like unlike you know, like physics, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. a, a lot of time when you describe something, okay, like if you think about the. Uh, uh, astrophysics it's mostly observation mm-hmm. right you, you observe you can't do anything but you have a, such a strong model behind it about like why uh, data will emerge in a certain way mm-hmm. and the and the descriptive model itself is a causal model right like by description you can explain the mechanical process one thing leads to another right so even if like you build a probability model but with the things that like the literature that I'm reading, like say for the beta carotene, like, well, we don't have a, a biological model like beta carotene in the lung cancer, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what you have, it's, it's the, there's no uh, layers or model built already uh, that you can like making good predictions, right? Mm-hmm. It's very different from, uh, from uh, physics. So, so as a result, you you run regression. You look for the coral. I'm mean, regression basically linear correlation. You try to uh, uh, look for pattern between two variables, mm-hmm. and then when you keep getting them, so you build confidence. You think there's something there, right? Right. And um, but then that wasn't the thing that you were actually looking for. Are uh, you you don't have a mod, You don't have a theory behind it. So you run into this kind of dangerous, uh, you know, inference. I'm um, to the credit they did do the randomized trial, right? Try to figure like, is this true? Um, and the last time I read it, you know, I know they were they were struggling with uh, with some interpretation, for example, because uh, lung cancer is still not well. Cancer overall is not very frequent. Uh, um, oh, that's a uh, thing. So what they do, they tend to work these trials on uh, people who smokers or former smokers, right? So that you don't spend like a billion dollar on experiment. Right? You need a large mm-hmm. sample to get the mm-hmm. outcome. And they thought, well, maybe there was interaction between you know, the cigarette smoke and beta carotene. But you can see that they're struggling with the mm-hmm. problem, right? And um, but I, let me so so having said that, like just come back to this uh, recent paper I read on uh, on colonoscopy. Um, it just published a few months ago in New England Journal of Medicine. So it's very interesting because uh, because uh, you know it's regularly recommended um, that uh, um, you know people fifty years or older should get uh, uh, screened. Have you mm-hmm. got it, John? Maybe you haven't reached fifty. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in the United States, in fact, they're pushing the age down to forty-five, mm-hmm. right? And uh, that's an all plausible reason to say, well, would you colonoscopy in some ways the <clears throat> most, um, in some way that's the most reasonable one to to think that way because with it's not only a preventative measure, but it's also. Uh, 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 therapeutic because where they go if they see polyp they would just oh, cut yeah. it out right away a lot mm-hmm. of other screening like you screen like lung cancer you screen something then there'll be treatment right there's a whole long process but colonoscopy is really good you go in and you cut it out and, and it's so low ri- it's low risk it's it's, it's no a- fun but it's it's there's not much risk yeah no fun that's the thing right it's no fun. It's a huge <laughs> problem Mm-hmm. Uh, so did, did this trial in um very very good one I think you know in the Nordic, Nordic countries are great doing epidemiological trial because people don't move around as much as mm-hmm. like Southern California, mm-hmm. um, and they do it for fifty five and up and um, so if you look at the results uh, this is a randomized control trial, right, um 
so you have a plausible reason to believe this procedure should be good and preventive, everything. There was zero results. Wow. Oh. <laughs> there was zero results. It's very interesting. Um, wow. It's not a critique of the paper. It's a fantastic study. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful study. But it's funny. I just want to point out how the paper concludes. Right? The paper concludes says, well, the experimental group uh, is less likely to get cancer. <laughs> it's true, <laughs> okay, but there's no <laughs> difference in mortality. So the results. Oh, they die of other things. Exactly. Oh, they they. <laughs> <laughs> so the the actually the overall uh, uh, kind of colonoscopy results were so so minimal right but it is true that they are uh, they're less likely to get cancer because they get polyp cut out mm -hmm. okay right they get polyp cut out mm -hmm. and so they're less likely to uh, develop uh, the uh, no uh, the cancer on this particular cancer they try to screen right but here's an example of a uh, of the problem like um like you don't have a model about human behavior in this case because uh, in uh, in the associate uh, um, uh, things that relate to whatever intervention you're doing, right? So in this case, even though you have a pretty good uh, um, biological theory, mm -hmm. right? And um, and I should I should add to this because uh, uh the study shows like only like 40, on average, 42% people go get screened, right? And um, so they did the more analysis. So here's, so here's an example, like uh, it's not exactly a uh, linear regression so much, but, um, but conceptually really related. What they do, they say they did so-called per protocol analysis, like because only 42% people, um, uh, you know, when to get screen. Like, what if you assume everybody did go to get screen, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, strictly speaking, you're not supposed to do that. The whole idea of randomized control trials, you don't do this kind of conditional analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what uh, what would happen, you know. In the, but even after they did that, it was very minimal. And um, so that's kind of example of, of uh, for me, like always give me kind of pause, like uh, in some way, like, you know, the regression model in our field is just like used too much almost. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you really have to kind of think about like, what's your model in this, like if I'm looking specifically for the colonoscopy model ex experiment, it basically says, well, the, the human body and the human behavior is such a complex system. And uh, like if you, if you on, only intervene on one particular variable, like you really kind of have to have a more comp comprehensive theory oh. about like what people would do, right? So, so you kind of mentioned something early on, like, well, the... People die from other things. Right. Right. And let me just finish up this kind of funny. Uh, uh, John said it's uncomfortable. Like, well, it's extremely uncomfortable because you lost working days. You had to prepare for it. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're actually the cheaper uh, alternative to it, you know? Oh, you know, it doesn't be so invasive. Mm -hmm. But but that for me, that's example of like importance of experimental design. Mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. Like just rely on on relaxation. In this case, it's a very good example because colonoscopy in many ways the it's the most sensible screening thing to do. Well, and I think just to say, like uh, here you have a negative result, and it turns out that it's very meaningful. You know, I mean, yeah. it's maybe counterintuitive. Uh, maybe it's not one we would want. Maybe it's um, not one we would even accept. But it's very helpful, like in order to, it's sobering. 
Yes. And I think that's, yeah. you know, so that that sobering effect that it, when done well, this can be very sobering. Um, I was wondering, John, you, what are your thoughts on, on what we've been talking about? Well, no, I think they're all cautionary tales. You know, of course, um, my uh, interface with statistics is in addition to teaching it at the elementary level, um, which I'm not happy about the particular class that we offer, but um, the just the application of statistics in in education, you know, I've always found um, is both not very compelling and also very annoying because a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the papers, you know, I, I become aware of from my colleagues and so forth are written by math educators who know better, you know, who sh but it turns out that math educators, you know, they understand mathematical statistics, but I don't think they, I don't think they understand practical statistics very well, you know, um, and so this is a different, you know, we open up this conversation by saying, you know, Shu Hong, you were saying that, you know, the mathematical layers be behind statistics aren't your expertise. It's not clear that that expertise confers any advantage oh. when it comes oh, no. to <laughs> <laughs> successfully applying statistics, because my math colleagues are constantly quoting statistics that uh, don't you know, are interesting uh, just from, a, you know, the point of view of looking at data, but um, they also try to, there's an implied inference that you make from those statistics that I think is completely unjustified, uh, especially in education where it's very hard to randomize, it's very hard to um, uh, control it's very hard to do experimental design just like it is in in, in medicine and do it in an eth ethical way you know um because you have human subjects and so you know for, for example i <laughs> you know i'm going to be presenting on friday some statistics that came out of a study uh, from our school that our school, our, our, our college is required by the state of California to produce these studies, I think mm -hmm. every year or every two years, where we look at what's called disproportionate impact. Um, basically, um, lower success among various groups, uh, females versus males, uh, various ethnic and racial groups versus the out group, in other words, the, the group that is uh, everybody else other than that group uh, lgbt um and so we're, we're we're presenting some statistics but of course these studies are completely neutral in terms of making any conclusions which i think is the correct way to be it's not saying for example if we find that um first generation college students um, don't complete degrees or certificates at the same rate as the outgroup as as non first generation college students. You know that statistic is reported, but no conclusion is made from it, which I think is okay. You know, but everybody's going to make conclusions. <laughs> That's the problem. We're going to present these statistics, and people are going to say we're not doing very well with first generation college students. And so, um, so that that's my problem is that you know we we often want to there's a belief uh, in in all aspects of education that you know everything should be data driven, but the problem is is that that data is often misinterpreted, uh, and. You know, we we try to make inferences and conclusions based on that data that are I, I think are completely unfounded. So that that's sort of my my uh, <laughs> you know my personal my personal um, uh, a diatribe about about the use of statistics in education. You know, we're constantly seeing these numbers, 
and even though inferences aren't explicitly made based on those numbers mm -hmm. in our conversations and in our personal analysis and our conversations in the hallway and so forth we're constantly making those inferences and it happens in the math department where we know better you know and so yeah i don't i i don't I think that these studies have very limited value, you know, and so how do you proceed in education? How do you improve in education? And I think that's, that's the big open question is that, you know, to what extent should data uh, play a role? And I think it should play a role. I think that, you know, we should make measurements and so forth, but we should be very careful about how we, how we in, in, interpret them. And my own personal belief is that we make improvements on edu education is a is a complex uh, culture, you know, and we change that culture, not so much based on numbers we're getting or hard science or studies, but based on our own, our own personal beliefs and opinions and how we're influenced by our peers and what, what inspires us, you know, it's not, you know, we try to we try to pretend that things are data driven, but it, it really is it. It's very, it's very personal in terms of uh, how we adjust our teaching, and and maybe it should be that way. I mean, um, teaching is subtle, and I think it's kind of an art form when practiced at a high level. And you know, would you ask a musician uh, to like suppose a musician is trying to up their game so should they listen to the top 1000 pieces of all time you know uh, musical works of all time and then somehow analyze what what um you know make some kind of a objective analysis of what makes them good and then try to try to move in that direction in, in their in their own art form i, I think it, you know it is patently ridiculous when you talk about it in terms of art but we try to do that in education. I think education is is kind of, um, you know, at a, at at the high levels, at, at at practice at a high level is more like an art form, you know. And uh, so, what makes a great teacher? I mean, I've had a, a a handful of them in my past, and I try to emulate that in my teaching, you know. And um, and I think that you know it's the the answer is not not clear you know yeah it's the 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 i think when all the math people do have an advantage like if they care to use <laughs> use use them the 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 big issue here is um is uh like the criteria for what's uh, kind of acceptable interpretation is so uh kind of context dependent right the example you give john well there's a correlation that you found right so the in this case the uh, 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 first generation kids uh, kids are not doing as well right well that's a that's a statistical fact but like you let's say there's three interpretations like depending on where you are in a, no, any social context one of them could be have much easier time to be accepted by other than others than than you know one to three so that's the that's probably the where the caution really should be like like i'm not opposed to uh to use the uh regression model with my uh, students like for exploratory purpose you need to detect pat right but don't like uh, rely on the on the easiest answer to the <laughs> Uh, to the results and they're often misleading in um maybe maybe to jump in um uh, like in this example um when you think about what to do about it which is what john is saying exactly see then this category uh may no longer be helpful like this category is helpful in saying that you know you can track it and see but really like in terms of helping it 
it may be three, five, seven different little subgroups, which are just completely different. And the interventions with each of those subgroups would be completely different um, mm -hmm. based on those people's motivation and, uh, but, you know, just interests and what they want to do with their lives. Like they're not a monolithic group. You this, know, this is the challenging part. This is the challenging part. And, you know, there's one. And, and, and so, for example, you know, of what both of you just said, um, we do not track regional uh any regional data and in, in particular zip code data from where students are coming from and we don't make any attempt to adjust for that and there's been some recent studies uh, in the last 20 years that say zip code is a huge predictor of success academically and in career and um and so if that is the case if we if we decide that that is the main um causal or cor you know co correlational variable then it, it it speaks to a certain kind of intervention perhaps you know having bridge programs to certain schools or actually actually working with certain zip codes to um to try to change change the conditions for those students as opposed to creating some program for a certain group within our college uh that tries to remediate you know for that group in other words it might be the entirely wrong place to remediate um and it might be for the entirely wrong reason that and it that, could backfire i mean it could it could actually make you know not address the problem and kind of create a new problem <laughs> it could no it's, it could. it's um, totally possible so the it's the i think analysts are like it's a key is like what to do about it, right? That's when you, okay. but that's when you need the actual model about like what's what's the cause and uh, and it's the data pattern is true. I have a story maybe I would tell uh, just maybe why I'm interested in linear regression, where it led me and you know how it relates to this question. Uh, I was studying John with John quantum physics. And so uh, through this combinatorial study of the Sheffer polynomials, uh, uh, in finding this classification uh, and realizing it that relates to the generalized uh, linear model. And th there's like the five-fold, six-fold classification of natural exponential families with quadratic variance function, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, so I need to understand linear regression so that I can understand like how it branches out in different directions. But basically like, uh, going beyond uh, linear regression you can start to compare things in different zones i think in different you know but it's very limited uh, kinds of comparisons you can do it turns out and so this combinatorics is explaining that more intuitively so uh, as i got to uh, study this um raimundus of inconus uh, suggested that uh, i uh, sign up for the structural equation modeling uh, network uh, discussion group there's like three thousand people signed up and uh, from that, I learned about Judea Pearl's work on causation versus uh, correlation. He has this book of why I'm starting to read. And finally, I, I wrote a letter explaining about, you know, I'm working on this classification, such mm -hmm. nobody replied except for one kind person. Uh, he was kind of philosophical. Uh, he, he does um, test validity for things like intelligence. You know, so he wrote a book on uh, validity of tests. Uh, and so he and so I'm talking about cognitive frameworks. I'm basically saying that the cognitive framework that you know I would talk about when we were graduate students, like you know, every effect has had its cause, not every cause has had its effect. There's a critical point for deciding it's a fivefold way. So this fivefold way seems to be appearing in these classifications, you know. Um, and so when Judea Pearl says, well, there's you know correlation, then there's intervention, then there's counterfactuality. Well, what he calls intervention. Like when you do something, right? I would call it uh, every effect has had its, I mean, has had its cause. But counterfactuality would be saying, but there's things that we don't know and they haven't happened. Like, you know, that not every cause has had its effects. So you have this double causality or two directions of causality. Anyway, so I wrote about these cognitive frameworks and he was a little bit skeptical about it, but kind. And then I wrote this kind letter, but pushing back a little bit saying, hey, you use these cognitive frameworks, the, the people that you talk about, they use them, I can show. But everyone is working in terms of latent variables, you see? And what are these latent variables? Like, can you build a model? Can you build a science out of the study of latent variables? So the example that I thought of was like, you know, 
sight, uh, sound, you know, taste, uh, touch, uh, smell, like those are five common sense concepts, which are just completely physically not uh, grounded, right? But they would be like latent variables, so to speak, right? And you could have a whole theory. How would you ever disprove this theory based on, you know, the types of linear regression and models that are, you would never, you would never come into a conflict, I don't think. They would just keep going and going and going, or like Chinese medicine. How would you critique, <laughs> exactly. Chinese, you know, it would just, not to criticize Chinese medicine, you know, but <laughs> but I'm just saying that none of these things could ever be made into models from a latent variable analysis, I think. But is that, what do you think, Xu Hong? Well, maybe I can uh, tell you one experiment that kind of pick, mm -hmm. can I just uh, pick up on your, your, your allusion to Chinese medicine? Yes, but but, uh, but kind of illustrate uh, kind of illustrate some of the things we're discussing here. Um, the so here's the the true experiment was done in Germany on mm -hmm. acupuncture, right? And um, so this is like one of my favorite experiments, and it, it would have so the people who have back pain would be randomly assigned to three mm -hmm. groups. One group is uh, getting standard uh, pain medication. Mm -hmm. you, you, all these people have back pain, right? And the two other groups get uh, uh, acupuncture and, and administered by people who are trained, right? Very well trained people. Um, but here comes the interesting part of the experiment. So one group, they would, the, they would do exactly according to the theory of acupuncture, right? That's a very elaborate theory. You know, people go to college for four years to learn to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, John might know my brother is very good at that, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, but in uh, the third group, also done by the uh, same uh, type of, uh, you know, trained people, but they will be pushing the active pressure point at random. They choose the wrong spots to, to oh. stick the needle in. Okay. Uh, do you care to? And they know they're the wrong spots. No, it's like they know. That according to you're not supposed to go there because the theory tells because there's a whole uh, movement of chi in your body, right? There's a there's right. a network of chi, so you need to stick the. So right that, that that third group is uh, doing acupuncture on the spots that they know are wrong, but they're, they're doing wrong. it anyways. But they do it in the way they taught how to do it. But right? they do it in the, the, the right style, but in the wrong Right style, but the wrong, wrong, wrong. But according to theory, it's going to have absolutely no therapeutic effect, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not going to make you guess, but in the interest of time. So the experiment shows both acupuncture group are doing better than the drug. So acupuncture obviously worked. Mm -hmm. However, the two acupuncture group have the same result. So, so here you so prove that you prove the theory both right and wrong at the same time. And and I think that that maybe supports my intuition that like uh, the symptom can be analyzed, you know, like but what's going on inside cannot be figured out based on uh, I mean it can't be tested. I think that's the thing. Like it could be the you theory can, may you can be make valid up, in some way. There may be very good things about the theory, right. but but that's not gonna tell you how the it's not going to correct the theory for you. Like maybe the theory is 90% correct, but it's not going to give you the extra 10% that you need to make the theory 100%, you know, to make the theory actually valid. Right. Is that, that's a yeah, possible it, conclusion. Like basically you have a, almost like the quarks, <laughs> you know, like it's inside, you can't get to it, but you could test a theory, right? That right. The, in this case, uh, it's fascinating experiment because uh, because shows like, well, there's something about this whole Chinese medical theory about this acupuncture is correct on a certain right. level, certain level abstraction. And, right? and, and, well, and, well, on a very basic symptomatic level, it, right? I mean, like, extreme, it's just, well, it's a randomized trial. It's a, obviously right. have positive clinical outcome. Right. People get cured. Right in a sense, right? Well, and, but on a very simple level, like it's sticking the needle in, you know, <laughs> well, in, a qualified, know. in a qualified way, like not in a just hurting people. Yeah, in question, a qualified question. way. Question: uh, Shu Hong, mm. was, was there was there a control group where no treatment was given? No, no. In this case, no. It would be, in fact, it would be a little bit difficult to do because uh, yeah, because people because want uh, it. people want it, right? Because That's a, a big problem doing human experiment. But yeah. they got really lucky because both both grew outperformed the drug. The drug, by the way, is a proven drug. 
it's mm -hmm. like uh, covered by the German uh, health right. system, right? So it wasn't random drug they're taking. It's so painkiller. I think this is a this is a uh, uh, more evidence that drugs are bad for you. I think uh, maybe <laughs> well, you, you want the control group. <laughs> yeah, we want the control group. I mean, I have a I have a, I have a quick theory of, yeah. about it, is that when you take the drug, it reduces your pain, so you continue doing the activity that's messing you up because you're not feeling mm. it. And well, they all improved. Oh, they did improve. They all improved, like well, pre-post test. Well, okay? so it, so it. So you do need a control group, right? <laughs> if yes, you really you want to be hard, <laughs> if you really want to be hard nose about it, you do need a control group. I'm actually inclined to believe in this case that the the acupuncture actually did work. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, but it's fascinating because it related to what Andrews was saying earlier, right? Like, what is what is this? Uh, this is like you create a name for the things you're doing and uh, you call it a something, right? And uh, you you label them, you have a descriptive theory about why this things happen this way. Mm -hmm. But it could, in, this, in the literal sense, it's probably wrong. But uh, in many other sense, in, in another sense, it's correct. In this case, it was experimentally proven, right? It's a... Uh, it's did uh, you know, apart from uh, John's criticism, maybe drug was harmful. It, it shows that uh, it uh, you know reduced uh, the alleviate pain for the people who were, uh, you know, going to the clinic. But but the very specific part of the uh, explanation about why acupuncture worked was obviously incorrect in this case because you'd stick the needle in the wrong place. And another thing, um, I mean, I'm great that we're all here and we're talking about this. Another thing that I wrote in that uh, conversation was um, um, that um, I think his, his name was Keith. He suggested reading a book on causation, maybe by Humphreys, I think, I forget. But the uh, in the very beginning of that book, the person said, I'm going to take two axioms. But the first axiom, the first axiom is that um, scientific explanation is um, a satisfactory explanation scientific explanation is true right mm -hmm. he's gonna say we're gonna take this as an axiom and the reason being that he wanted to compare that with non-scientific explanations right well as a scientist maybe not as much as john but like you know the physics we learned the physics i know it's not true like but it's satisfactory you know a lot of a lot of it's very satisfying or or it's simply not satisfying like so you know, you look at quantum field theory, people know that absolutely it is not true uh, because it just doesn't make sense. You know, it just doesn't hang together. I mean, but they have this slogan, shut up and calculate. Like you get good numbers, you get great numbers, let's say. You can get great numbers, but no one really believes that why we're getting these numbers. You know, it's just completely hot, ad hoc, hodgepodge. The theory is just ridiculous. So that we know that the theory is not true and it's not really even satisfying. But it's certainly scientific and it's certainly successful and it's certainly embraced. And but it certainly helps us progress. So, but that's not so odd. Like, I mean, even like this model of, you know, like the atom going, I mean, the electron going around the nucleus, like that's just completely false. But that's very helpful also, you know, and that helped contribute to progress. So when a a, a, a thinker, you know, is writing this book on causation, and then he says that it's an axiom, you know, this type of statement, it just becomes very difficult to read that book. But I just also noticed that whole idea of having axioms. You see, I'm trying to say, why do we need axioms? You know, you must have millions of axioms and they're basically just formulations of common sense, you know, and they're basically wrong, you know, instead of trying to have cognitive frameworks where you say, look, I have two, three things. I may not know what they are, but let's say I know that there's three of them and I, they have this kind of cyclic structure, let's say, and let's work on what they are, but like, but that's what it is. So if I was trying to build a theory and saying, I think it's a threefold cycle, you know, at least I has meaning what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to, it could be right or wrong, but at least it has meaning. Well, uh, I'm going to, to leave. I'm sorry, because I asked for 10 minutes from yeah. the other person. But Thank I just you. want to finish this. Uh, maybe you're, you're not going to like to hear this. Andres, because I keep thinking yeah. like your model would be more likely to be successful in uh, physics than in, a, in human <laughs> behavior. But I know you you like to describe oh. human behavior. 
<laughs> but the right. thing is, though, I have heard you talking though for a long time. That's always kind of my impression. I keep thinking like all these abstract model you're coming up with, you'd be more likely to succeed in in, in physics because that's example, why we're working I, on the physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the example I give it. to you, we're doing it. Yeah, the example I give to you, like I the one that I feel like the progress being made, they tend to be experimental studies, mm-hmm. but not the descriptive like, regression model. I mean, the regression model points us to somewhere, but mm-hmm. the more definitive example. Uh, even the last example I gave about the Chinese medicine, right? It's uh, you, you feel like the real information came through uh, in the experiment. Mm-hmm. Why you could debate about whether this chi is a real thing or not forever, right? Right. But, uh, and uh, so almost like when it comes to the, the kind of model you, you, you just kind of this abstract structure you created, it, it almost like require experimental study to, to push you know, to test it, like when it comes to human behavior, like if you talk about people making moral choice and things like that, right. you know, it almost requires some kind of a real clever experiment to to force them to. So I want to thank uh, you, Shu Hong. I want to end with a prayer to thank God that we could be together. And I just want to, sh- I feel that like beautiful things happen, you know, when we're able to be together like this. And so I hope that we can do this again. Hope we can publish this if you decide that we can. And then, uh, Thank you to God. Thank you, Shuhong. Thank you. And, uh, and, you. and nice like, subscribe, uh, support me through Patreon. This is <laughs> enough for wisdom. Good seeing everyone. Good to see you.